Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, indeed, we come before you. We want to thank you. We thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ. We want to thank you that we are here today to listen to your word. So indeed, word may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, for you are our Lord and our Redeemer, for we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Very good afternoon, church. It is a uh, joy for me to share the Word of God with everyone today. Now, I'm not too sure about you, but I think last Wednesday was quite a memorable day for me. You all know what happened last Wednesday? <laughs> because it was not only the fifth day of Chinese New Year, it was also the Valentine's Day. It was also Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the land, of course. And also, if you have not noticed, you have not been receiving any WhatsApp or news or watching any news at all. It was also one of the most historical day in the history of our church, which was the unveiling of the 100 years old time capsule. Okay? So, I'm not going to lie to you. That day, there was quite a lot of things happening. And I was actually having like a mini identity crisis, okay? not knowing how to feel. Is it like a celebratory mood? Because Chinese New Year. Is it like romantic mood? Because, you know, Valentine's. Somber mood, maybe, Ash Wednesday. Or maybe historical pride for our church, right? But anyway, talking about the time capsule reveal, I was there. Uh, it was very exciting. I took lots and lots of photos. And I also subconsciously sent lots and lots of photos to my wife on a Valentine's Day. <laughs> Those photos, okay? So, when I reached home, and this is literally what happened, okay? When I reached home, my wife literally, literally took the phone, showed the picture to me, took her phone, showed the picture to me, and said, so, is this how Valentine's Day going to be from now on? <laughs> you sending me uh, books, you know, and uh, historical pictures, right? Not very romantic, but nonetheless, um, you know, if you've been around, if you've been there, I think you, we, we all share the joy and the pride um, for the faithfulness of our uh, forefathers of this church. It was wonderful. Now, so if you're like me, right now you're sitting here, not, not knowing how to feel, uh, what, what, what day is it, right? And you are also having a mini identity crisis. May I, and you know, I, I sort of figured this out, may I offer a word that really captured the essence of all of that's happening on that day, okay? And that word is actually thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So indeed, we thank God for the new year. We thank God for our spouse, our boyfriend, our girlfriend. We thank God for His faithfulness upon our church from generations to generations. And last but not least, we thank God for His, our Creator. And indeed, from dust we come, and to dust we will return. Okay. And I think Thanksgiving is, in fact, is a good place to begin this afternoon sermon especially as we enter into the season of Lent. It is a sermon that demands us to reflect, to re-examine, to rediscover, and hopefully rededicate our life in gratitude and thanksgiving to our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Now, I was informed by Reverend Patrick that the series that we are at right now, the Sermon of the Mount, was not a new series, but it was actually a continuation from last year. I thought it was a new series. Uh, but it, it was a continuation from last year. And because of that, I won't spend too much time on the background and the context of the Sermon on the Mount. But I do want to say, however, that the Sermon of the Mount is absolutely crucial in seeing the bigger picture, which is the Kingdom of God. The Sermon of the Mount is paramount to our understanding of the Kingdom of God. And it can be said that the Sermon on the Mount is the heart or the center of the, king, of the understanding of the kingdom of God. And next week, when Reverend Patrick preached on the Lord's Prayer, that is the center of the center of the kingdom of God. The center of the center of the, uh, of the Sermon of the Mount, which is also the center of the kingdom of God. So no pressure, Patrick, just uh, preach on. <laughs> <laughs> but it is absolutely crucial that we understood this and we get this, right? Now, it certainly takes another sermon to preach about the kingdom of God. But the simplest way to understand the kingdom of God is that when Christ comes again, this old kingdom, what we see and what we experience and what we feel, 
Uh, this old kingdom of the world will pass, and there will come a new kingdom under a new king, which is Christ. That's like in a nutshell. And with a new kingdom comes new management with new rules, new way of life, and new values, okay? And the values of the kingdom of God is unlike anything that we have seen before. They are values that are not only different, but almost opposite to the worldly values. In short, when Jesus comes again, he will turn things as they say it, and I heard this in a camp before, I really love this uh, phrase. He will turn things as they say it, inside out, upside down, and right side up. He will turn things inside out, upside down, and right side up, okay? Now, here's another thing about the kingdom of God before I begin the sermon proper, right? We, as Christians, don't have to wait until the second coming of Christ to see the kingdom of God in action. Hence, it is called the already but not yet kingdom, okay? Meaning, the kingdom of God has not yet come in its fullness. It will only happen when Christ comes again. But at the same time, it was already set in motion by the death and the resurrection of Christ, does 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 say this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the what? New creation has come. The clock has begun ticking. The new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Meaning, if you have received Christ in your life and you are already, then you are already a citizen of this new kingdom, the kingdom of God and you are already living under this new way of life and these new values. Now, so of course, the obvious question then is, what does the kingdom of God look like? What are its values? And I think today's sermon, which is a part of the Sermon of the Mount, it provided us with the answer to that question, all right? So I just want to set all that up, okay? It's like uh, set the table for everyone, because I think it's important uh, to remember the big picture before we jump into the sermon proper, okay? Now, I only have two points for the sermon this afternoon, two points, all right? One, uh, authentic spirituality, which is also the title of the sermon. I can't think of another more catchy <laughs> first point, all right? So I'm just going to stick with the title of the sermon. It's called Authentic Spirituality. And then point number two is great is your reward in heaven. Okay, now let me just jump in, okay? I'm just going to move on real quick to the points. Now, if you look at the entire passage, Jesus used the actions of the first one is giving, the second one is praying, and the third one is fasting as case studies to bring about a certain truth about the kingdom of God. Now, these three ex uh, actions, giving, praying, fasting, they are almost interchangeable, or shall I say they are interchangeable, at least in this passage. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that in all the Bible, they're interchangeable. I'm saying that at least in the passage that we read today, all these three actions are interchangeable, meaning Jesus is not trying to give specific teaching or workshop on giving, the different type of giving, tithes, offering, and all that. Not going to give us a workshop on praying, maybe the different types of praying or fasting, you know, like... Um, is it like a fasting, like the, the, the Solomon type, or uh, not Solomon, sorry, the, the Isaiah uh, fast or whatnot? So it's not that, okay? But what he's doing, in fact, is using these three examples to unearth, to unpack some of the very important kingdom principles that we ought to live by if we call ourselves the citizen of this kingdom. Basically, these are the principles that we ought to live by if we call ourselves Christians. So what are the important kingdom principles that Jesus is teaching us? Now, at first glance, if you, read, if you look at it, uh, then you can see that it seems like Jesus is teaching us that we should not give, we should not pray, and we should not fast in public, right? It seems like that. There's a contrast between, you know, don't do this in public, do this in secret, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So we should not do all pray, fast, you know, and give in public, but it has to be done in secret. But, brothers and sisters in Christ, that can't be the case because, uh, you know, just now we have prayed in the public a while ago. I began my sermon with praying in public. So does that mean that we have gone against the understanding of the kingdom of God? And if we are to take offering in secret, how are we going to do that? Okay, are we going to, uh, you know, ask everyone to wear masks while we take offering so that we can all do it in secret? We can't, right? Because, you know, we have done so in public, right? But so not only this is untrue in our context, but it is also untrue biblically. 
Because the Bible is full of public offering, in the book of Acts, we can see that in the early churches, it is full of public prayers. The Lord's Prayer, for example, is being taught upon us. It is full of mass fasting, so, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So prohibition on public giving, prayer and fasting is certainly not the point of the passage. We need to remember that. So it's certainly not the point of the passage that we are reading today. So if that's the case, then what is the point of Jesus' teaching? Come back again. What is the point of Jesus' teaching today? And I think it is here that a little bit of context will come a long way. Okay? Now, I understand that uh, some of us like Calvin and Hobbes. You all know the, 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 the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes? Uh, I know that Calvin, who was reading the Bible passage uh, today, is a fan of Calvin and Hobbes. Right? So, I don't know whether he likes it because there's Calvin there, lah, but... So, I actually managed to find a Calvin and Hobbes comic strips that beautifully captured the point that uh, I wanted to convey through the passage, okay? I don't know whether you can read this. Can you all read this? The comic strip, all right? So, if you, you, if you can't, then um, I, I shall read it to you. Um, anyway, so, so the, the, the first panel is... Calvin said, I think I should stay home from school. I got a sore throat, an earache, a stomach ache. I'm seeing spots and I'm dizzy, okay? Okay, kids, this is not trying to teach you how to... how to ponteng, eh? Not... <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 please don't say, hey, pastor, teach on. <laughs> okay, but there's a lesson here, okay? So that's what Calvin said in the first panel. The second one, of course, the mom is like, wow, that's serious. I'll call the doctor. And then... Of course, certainly, Calvin is like, hold on, hold on. I think it's all clearing up. Yes, yes. I think I'm better now. And here's the takeaway. It's pretty hard to hit that magic number of appropriately vague, okay? Mildly serious, but not quite worrisome symptoms, okay? So basically, Calvin was pretending to be sick in order to skip school. Lah. But unfortunately, he didn't pretend well enough. So he didn't manage to portray the image of sick enough to stay home but not sick enough to be worrisome, right? So contextually, this is exactly what the religious leaders at the time of Jesus, especially the Pharisees, are doing. They are pretending to portray a certain image to the public so that people will think that they are virtuous. They are giving in public, for example, so that people will think that they are generous. They are praying loudly, with, most likely with flowery language, so that people will think that they are pious, and they wanted to let people see that they fast so that people would think that they are humble and full of repentance. And Jesus hated this. He hated it. Okay? And this is clear in verse 16 when Jesus was addressing the issue of fasting. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. You can almost interchangeably take that word hypocrites out and put Pharisees there. See. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. There is some great acting skill they have, okay, with makeup and all that, okay? So it's a serious thing for them to pretend, right? And truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, and because of that, you can see that Jesus actually called them hypocrites. Now, note that there are some nuances here, uh, especially in our modern or common understanding of hypocrites. Now, usually when we call uh, somebody a hypocrite, it is because, what is it? It's because we ask someone to do a certain thing, but then we don't do it ourselves. That's a hypocrite, right? So, for example, if we as parents ask our family members to pray and read the Bible, parents can do it. Oh, must read the Bible, must pray, okay? But then, uh, we ourselves don't pray and read the Bible. Who are we? We are hypocrites. That's the definition of hypocrites, right? Or say, let's say if pastor preach about loving one another, but after that, he go and mistreat his staff, uh, then he is a hypocrite. And that's our understanding of hypocrite, right? But there are some nuances here that's quite interesting, right? But here's the thing about it. This is not what happened here, you see. It's not what happened here. So the Pharisee is not like, Pharisee say that, hey, you're fast, ah, and then he eat. It's not that, okay? Because the Pharisees, they do give. Do you see it? They do pray. They do fast. 
They do it. In fact, probably not in the scripture, but most likely they give more, they pray better maybe, and they fast longer. I don't know what that means. Huh? Fast, fast longer, what? a year. Huh? I, I don't know. Okay? But that's, that's what's happening here. So when Jesus called them a hypocrite and when Jesus condemned that, it is not because they are not doing the things that they are supposed to do, but because they are doing it with the wrong motivation. Motivation. So if you read this passage carefully, then you will see that clearly what Jesus is saying is this. Doing something for God with the wrong motivation, note this, did I put it in bold? Okay, that has to be in bold, okay? Doing something for God with the wrong motivation is the same if not worse. Can I just take away the word the same? Is worse, okay? Doing something for God with the wrong motivation is worse than not doing it at all. Here's something for us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Coming to church with the wrong motivation is the same if not worse they're not coming to church at all. Serving the Lord in whatever ministry that God calling you to with the wrong motivation is the same, if not worse, than not serving at all. Praying, giving, fasting. I don't need to go on. You get the point. With the wrong motivation, it's the same as not doing, if it's not, if it's worse. All right? Now, you know, talking about fasting, uh, and this is just a personal sharing. How many of you fasted or fast regularly on Lent? Anyone? No, no, I'm not, it's not an, an, an entrapment kind of question. I'm not seriously asking. Anyone here fast for Lent? Uh, uh, Reverend Patrick, maybe next year we can do a <laughs> fasting exercise. Okay, anyway, speaking of fasting, okay, so just a personal sharing. So I remember once during Lent, I decided to fast, okay? And so I follow a fasting, I, I don't remember which one, I think it's John Wesley's uh, uh, fast, okay? So basically, not eating from 9 uh, a.m. to 6 p.m., so, okay? Not eating from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., okay? So, and I remember that because I was not experiencing it, it was the worst time ever, okay? I'm supposed to abstain for food, but all I could think of is food. All I could think of is food, Okay? And I remember this happened, okay? One day, okay? One day, as I was fasting, as I was about to break fast, it was almost 6 p.m., okay? My wife actually came to me and say, oh, so, so sorry, uh, actually, right, you know, the food not ready yet. I'm, I'm, I'm still cooking, eh, right? And, and you have to wait a bit longer. And I remember that time uh, when I heard that, right? Food not ready, eh, food, eh. Food not ready, right? right? I blew up, okay? And I blew up in front of her. I blew up right in front of my kids, you know? And then I just went on and just on her, you know? Just how could you? You know, I fast for 12, you know, 12 hours. I'm very hungry there. Eh? You know, like, huh? 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eh? I have to work some more. Why food not ready? You know? All that, you know? Huh? You ever try hunger or not? All that, you know? Afterwards, okay, afterwards, once I come down and think about it, I feel so bad, okay? And after a proper apology with gift and all that, la, sorry, la, you know, the kind of, yeah. After that, right, I start to having a short reflection to myself. Why did I fast in the first place? Why did I do that? Is it really for God? Because if I'm doing it for God, then I failed miserably. I think I'm fasting. It's not for God, but it's for me. I failed miserably because instead of glorifying Him, right, I realized that right, through this action of fast, instead of glorifying Him, right, I have just became the biggest stumbling block for my wife, for my kids, to know God and to love Him more. Do you get it? This is action without motivation. This is action to show, action to pretend, whatever it is. And that's what happened. But let me just give you a little bit of disclaimer. Just a little bit, okay? But if you are new to the faith and you're here today, okay, 
I understand this. You could have been here for many different reasons, okay? Could be fellowship, friends. When I was a youth worker, you know, all those boys actually come to me and say, Ref, you know, actually I come for the girls, you know, <laughs> right? I, I, whatever reason that you're here, okay, whatever it is, I just want to say this to you, okay? I think that you might have your own reason, but God also has a reason to bring you here. You have a purpose being here, okay? And I hope that you will eventually not stop there, lah. Cannot be like looking for girls in the same church for 25 years, right? Cannot like, I mean, eventually you will move out of it and you will come to know the one true living God because that one true living God is the answer to whatever things that you were searching for and he will give you more than anything that you could have think of and imagine, okay? That's Christ, okay? But if you've been a Christian for years and you're still going through the motion, there are people just like that. They're coming to church 30 years, but don't know, okay? Uh, when I was in one of the church that I serve, I actually know of um, not our member, but an attendee uh, who has been in the church for 30 years, okay? But he's not a Christian, never been baptized, talk to him, try to evangelize to him so many times, don't want to receive Christ. And he's there because he loved his wife very much. So it's quite amazing, okay? But if you are like that, just go through the motion. You don't know why you're here. And you know that you are here, and you know that you're not here for the right reason. Then I think, you know, maybe season of Lent, time to re-examine, reflect, and to pray. I think we all need to do that. I think we all need to do that on a daily basis, Okay. So indeed, our heart motive of doing something is of the utmost importance to God because people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel 16, verse 7b. I mean, that's actually, if you ask me, that's what is 1 Samuel all about, about that. Okay, that's the book of 1 Samuel. Now, but allow me to go just one level deeper by adding on to this, okay? Because I think that it is not just about the heart but it's actually righteousness of the whole person, righteousness of the whole being. Now, there was a, a, this story that uh, I heard a long time ago when I was a youth worker, and I absolutely loved this story. And it's a story about a father and son in a car. So the father's driving, and the son, Besitiam, you know, like, you know, like all those kids, huh? Besitiam. Huh? Um, and, and so he keeps standing up in the car. You know how dangerous it is for your little kid to stand in a car while you're driving, right? So the father look at the son and say that, Sit down, right? And the son is like, you know, stubborn and don't want to listen to the father. Wow, stand up more, you know, like, wow, now, now not just stand up, but wow, move around, right? Like that, right? So the father said, sit down. And the son is like, no, 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 I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to sit down, right? And the father is so angry and then he just look at the son and he says, sit down. And the son's like, <gasps> Okay, man, that's scary. Eh? Sorry, uh, kids, not trying to scare you, but... Yeah, I mean, it's good for you to sit down too, lah. So, but... <laughs> not... <laughs> right, so, so the son is like... <gasps> frozen, right? Sat down. Okay, sat down. But you can see that he's not happy. And he's grumbling. That's why you can see the picture there. I can't find a picture with two kids, like, the same one. So that's all the same. But yeah, I, I, I meant to illustrate the same uh, boy, okay? Uh, so the... <laughs> Uh, the son sat down, but he's not happy. And then after that, after a while, he look at the father and say, Daddy, you need to know something, okay? I might be sitting down on the outside, but I am standing up on the inside. <laughs> okay? So Jesus was angry at the Pharisees because why? They are doing exactly that, you see. Do you see it? That's what they are doing. Because God knows the heart, ma. God knows the whole being, ma. Jesus knows that we are still standing out on the inside, right? So externally, it seems like they are doing exactly what God wanted them to do, these Pharisees. But internally, it is the exact opposite. You know, we are totally no different. And because you and I know this, because we could be sitting down right now in this sanctuary, uh, listening to the sermon, yet it could be, I'm not saying that, you know, all, but could be, yet our mind might be standing up elsewhere. But thinking about the food, travel, what's for dinner, all that, right? 
But here's the point. If you understood what Jesus is trying to teach us today, then you know that it goes beyond the motivation of the heart because Jesus wants the dedication of our whole being, not just the heart, the dedication of our whole being. It is our minds, our bodies, our wealth, our time, our gift. In short, it is our everything. So when you worship the God, uh, when we worship God here in this sanctuary, be here in totality in this sanctuary. That's what God wanted us to be, right? Now, these brothers and sisters in Christ is what I call authentic spirituality. You want to know what's authentic spirituality? This is, this, is, this is right there in this passage. And it is captured brilliantly in Matthew chapter 22, 37. And we know this, where Jesus said that we ought to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So basically, Jesus is not like, you know, giving us a list, but Jesus is basically saying that with everything, lah, everything that I give you, lah, everything, okay? That's the point. So that's my first point. Let me just move on to my second point real quick. And my second point is, is, great is your reward, okay? So the passage clearly told us that Jesus rejected the pious act of giving, praying, and fasting by the Pharisees because they have the wrong heart motivations. So the question then is this, if it is not to praise God, then what is the true motivation of the Pharisees? What is it that they want if it's not to praise God? And verse, us, uh, verse 2 sorry, uh, told us this, and this is in regard to, uh, uh, to giving, uh, that the Pharisees wanted to be honoured by others. That's in verse 2. In verse 5, and this is in regards to prayer, uh, it says that they want to be seen by others. That's verse 5. And in verse 16, and this is in regards to fasting, that they want to show others. Okay? So if you take it all together, you take it all together, then it is clear then that the Pharisees wanted to gain praise from men, not from God. Gain praise from men. And contextually, even in the modern era, Praise for men is quite powerful. The praise of men comes with its own reward. You and I know this. The more famous you are, the more well-known you are, the more reward you get. The praise of men comes with its own reward, such as status, such as connection, such as fame, such as power, eventually money, whatever it is. It comes with that. And that is actually what they are seeking here, Right? And because of that, Jesus had a kind of a snarky response to this, right? And in verse 5, he said that those people who seek this kind of reward, fame, power, whatever it is, instead of me, all these people who are seeking this kind of reward, they have received their reward in full. In full. That means no more liao. Bo liao. In full liao. You know like payment in full? If I pay in full, that means I'm not paying anymore. Lah, right? He says that you want reward, you, you're not going to get mine anymore, you know? Because you got your reward already, in full. That's why it says, meaning that if that's the reward that you are after, then that is the only reward that you will get. No more, okay? You will get reward only from men and nothing from God. That's very clear. Now, that's very interesting. We thought we can play both sides. We can. We either get from one or the other. But we are clear on this. We either serve God or money. We all know this. We are familiar with this. It's the same thing, right? Now, let me pause a little bit and sort of address this question that you might have right now, you know, thinking about all this, huh? because, you know, I use the word reward, right? So the question is, that you might have is this, right? As Christians, pastor, are we supposed to seek reward for the things that we do? Are we supposed to do that, seek reward? Now, I understand that in a Christian context, right? Especially in a Chinese Christian context, right? Such as this church, huh? The concept of rewards is generally frowned upon. Okay, uh, what are reward? Puyala, puyala. Oh, puyong, puyong, okay? Right? Because we are supposed to be altruistic and we are supposed to do good out of our own goodwill. Reward means that we are doing something with ulterior motive, right? And it could also potentially lead to all sort of misunderstanding about salvation and grace, and that's very dangerous, but that's not what I'm going to preach today. But you know that it can be misunderstood, right? Like, for example, people will ask then, oh, like, that got reward. Ah. That means I can earn my way to heaven because I will just keep doing good until God reward me with heaven. Sorry, that's not what it says in the Bible, right? So we need to be clear that salvation is not a reward 
that you earn, but it is only by grace through faith alone. Okay? But then again, if reward is a taboo in the Christian circle, I'm thinking that maybe we should change the word reward. I, I don't know, but the word reward is in the Bible. See? So I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to preach the Bible here, and this is what the Bible says, okay? So if, if reward is a taboo in the Christian circle, the question then is, why is the Bible full of promises of reward from our Heavenly Father? Do you realize that? It is full of promises of reward from our Heavenly Father. In this afternoon passage alone, there are already three mentions of rewards from God. Three already in one passage. In verse 1, reward from our Father in heaven. In verse 4, same. In verse 6, same, right? I mean, even Paul, even Paul in his last, uh, last writing, okay, before uh, his death, right? In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, I have fought the good fight. Remember that? It was a beautiful verse, okay? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. So he's expecting that when I pass over, I will get my rewards, right? Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. I'm just giving you a taste of what it is, okay? There are many more verses about promises of reward in the Bible. So I don't need, I don't, I, I, I think I don't need to come back with another 10 verses. I don't want to belabor the point. But I think that perhaps the point here, let me just offer this to you, can talk, you know, but the point here is not so much that we should not seek reward, but instead, we should not seek reward from men, but from God. We should seek reward only from God and not from men. In or. Uh, Another word that you can use is we should seek heavenly reward instead of earthly reward, right? Now, let me tell you this. Heavenly reward are vastly different from earthly reward in that reward from men is no reward at all. You know that, right? Because reward from men are fleeting, they are fickle, they are temporal. Uh, I want to stop here though because I will go and explore this in my next sermon. So I want to uh, reserve this so-called and I will go into it uh, next time. Uh, so I will come back again, okay, uh, when I talk about treasures in heaven. But you know that reward from men aren't going to make it because they are dead, okay? But I want to end today instead by focusing, then what is the reward that we seek from God? What is the reward from our Father in heaven that was so clearly captured in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, where it says that you seek reward from our Father in heaven. Now, what is that reward, Right? The first point I want to say is that that reward can't be, it can't be the things of earth. That means it can't be status, money, or power. That is not the reward that we are seeking for our Father in heaven. No. Okay? It can't be money, status, or power. And I think that's not the reward that God, our Father in heaven, wanted to give to us. Because those are earthly things. And the Bible is clear that when it comes to those things, we are supposed to steward and not use it for our own selfish personal desire. Now, let me, let me, let me just uh, end with this. The NASB, the New American Standard Bible, has quite an instance, uh, interesting translation to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, I put the two together so that you can see the difference between the NIV and then the NASB. And this is what it says in NASB, okay? It says, Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward, not from, but with your Father who is in heaven. He says that you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So instead of reward from your Father who is in heaven, it is read as reward with your Father who is in heaven. I personally think that this gave me a much better understanding of the concept for two reasons. One, when it says that there will be a reward with our Father, it is a promise of a future reward, meaning that it is a promise that we will be with God in heaven. That's the reward that we're going to get at Christian. At the end of our life, God will say that you are with me in heaven. God will be with, uh, the, that is our reward if we do things with the right motivation and dedicate our whole being unto the Lord. God, we will get to spend eternity with God in heaven. That's wonderful, right? 
But then it is sad if it stopped there. Lah. That means the whole motivation of us doing it is just, you know, wow, so that we can be with God in heaven. But then if you realize it, you know, reward with God in heaven is not just a future promise, but it is also a present promise. Okay? It is a present of a, uh, 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 sorry, it's a pr- promise of a present reward that God will also be with us on earth. Do you see that? So we will be with God in heaven, that's in the future, for sure, that's going to happen. But at the same time, while we are here on earth, struggling through, finding our way, battling with our flesh, God promised that He will never leave us nor forsake us, but He will be with us here on earth. God will be with us in good times or bad, in the valley or mountain peak, comes hell or high water. When we lost our job, God is with us. When we, when we you know, when, when, when maybe our, our kids don't get to the schools that we want them to be, when we went through a broken relationship, through loneliness, through trials by fire, through valley of the shadow of death, the promise is God will never leave us nor forsake us because indeed Emmanuel, God is with us. If that's not the best kind of reward, I don't know what is, right? Uh, let me just close with it. I just really want to say that I really appreciate... Uh, Reverend Patrick Sama on the first day of Chinese New Year. Do you, you all come for Chinese New Year service? The first day. Uh, the second day, Sama was so nice, but the first day. <laughs> as, first day of Chinese New Year, okay? If you, if you, didn't, um, if you didn't see it, um, please, I think maybe still on, the, on YouTube. Uh, and I really appreciate his uh, sermon on that, right? And, and he was talking about God's faithfulness to us. And, um, and, and he was talking about how God is watching us that the clothes on our back are not torn. And that's from uh, Deuteronomy, right? Yeah, Patrick, yeah. So that's from the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, because God is watching over the Israelites that the clothes on their back are not torn, right? And of course, he said that, in fact, nowadays, you know, we have to tear tear the the clothes ourselves, uh, make holes on the clothes, uh, just to make it more fashionable, okay? Um, Anyway, as I was listening to it, my takeaway as I was listening to me is, I say, Amen, brother. Because I know through my experience and I know through your experience, if you put your faith in God and you serve Him faithfully, God will never, ever shortchange you. Do you see where I'm coming from? God will never, ever shortchange you. If you're faithful to Him, He will be faithful to us all the days of our life and beyond. Not just all the days of our life, but beyond. Because we will be with Him. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, that there is no reward that the, this world now, or this temporary world like, can offer to us, right? That is greater than that. Nothing. There is no reward that anyone can offer me, two million, five million, whatever it is, right? That I will say that, yeah, I'll probably take that and then I don't want to take God's grace and God's mercy in my life. No way. Because God's faithfulness is more important than life. That's important. Let me close with this story. Now, I know that in my last sermon, I said a story about Christian persecution. I, I, I shared it. But uh, do allow me to share one more. I, I don't want it to be known as the Christian persecution pastors. Uh, that every, every time I preach, is about uh, sharing about Christian persecu- uh, persecution. But I, I do want to share uh, one more today. Okay? One more, just to drive home a point. Okay? And this is the story of um, a martyr the, the one who followed Christ and died for Christ. Um, sorry, can, I, can you blanko the thing first? Yeah, just, just uh, thank you. And um, uh, called Polycarp of Smyrna, and he lived around 69 to 156 AD. And um, what happened was that uh, um, he was, you know, um, he was preaching the good news and he refused to bow down to Caesar. As you all know, the Christian and the Adoese, and because of that, he was persecuted, Right? And he has uh, uh, managed to uh, escape from um, prison for many uh, years of his life. But finally, they caught up to him at an old age of 86. When he's 86, they caught up to him, right? And when they see him, and they, I mean, when they saw him, they are, they, he knows that he's going to be executed, right? But the guards who look at this old frail man, 86 years old, you want to execute a frail old frail man at 86 years old? I think the guard is like, I'm, I don't think I want to do that. And so the guard tried to persuade him. And the guard said, hey, you know, 
，uncle， you know， 为什么这样？这个啦，不用紧啦，你就讲没有耶稣啦，好吗 ？Caesar is Lord 啦，你就讲这样，那我 release you， then you can do whatever 啦。Just say that 啦。First time， no。Second time， no。Then after that, last time, third time. So you come, hey uncle, now serious now. Okay? The whatever is coming, okay? This is your last chance. You better, you better play it okay, lah. Play it cool, lah. You're so old, eh? Don't you want to die in peace? So old. Right? Why well, don't just renounce Christ and we call it even? And you know what he said at that moment? And he said this. Eighty and six years. Have I served him, and he never did me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King and my Savior? Eighty and six years. Even in the face of death, Polycarp testified to the faithfulness of God, and he says that, "How can I do this?" Because what he has given to me, I can never repay. And now you're gonna threaten me with death? Do you think I am scared? I'm not gonna do it at the end of my life because he has been faithful to me from the beginning of my life. Do you see that? You see the connection? Because of that, he was executed. So even in the face of death, God's faithfulness. God's reward to us that He will be with us is a part of what we are going through. That He will be with us through the days of our life. But not only that, even at the face of that, the promise of the Lord that He will be with us throughout eternity, when we will be with our Abba Father. That was the choice. That was given, and that was the choice that was taken. So the question is, what about you? What about all of us? There will be many rewards in the world, but there's only one reward that matters. And that is the goodness, the mercy, and the faithfulness of Christ. That God is with us. And we will be with God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we enter into the season of Lent, may I、um, just give all of us here just a few minutes for a time of reflection, of rethinking, of even a time of rededicating our life back to. Christ, the message that I shared today is not that we should not give, should not pray, should not fast. But the message today is that we should do all this, but we should do it with the right motivation. In the book of Matthew, chapter three, verse two, when it talks about the kingdom of God, the Bible says, "Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand." Repent. That's the key word. So there's no better time than today, than right now. So won't we take this time? To come back to the Lord, to confess of any sin that we have, the things that we are doing without the right motivations that hinders us from coming to God, from that hinders us from claiming the heavenly rewards that God wanted to give us.
It's indeed, Father God, we thank you. Thank you that you are our Abba, Father. May you form us in your image. May you die on the cross for us. That you loved us so. That you wanted to bless us, to reward us. You wanted to be with us. But Lord, sometimes because of our disbelief, our, our flesh, our sin and the sins in our life, Lord, we, we are going through the motions. We come to church, but we have no motivation of coming to church. We serve you, but we have no motivation of wanting to serve you. So we drag our feet. We pull out our hairs. We complain, we grumble. But all this time you have been waiting. Like a father who has been waiting for the return of the son. You have been waiting and you stretch out your arm and you say, I love you. And I want to bless you. I want to reward you, you see. And my reward, you'll never get from anything under in, in this world. Nothing can replace it. So Lord, it is our prayer this afternoon, even as we come before you. Give us, Lord, a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh that beats for you. And Lord, we want to dedicate our whole being, Lord, our soul, our body, our hearts, our gift, our strength unto you. To you and to you alone. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you, our Father, because you are a God that listens to our prayer, a God that understands us. We want to confess, Lord, that we are human. We have shortcomings. We have sins. So may you and may the Holy Spirit examine our hearts today. And may you renew us and may you refresh us. And we pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.